<clears throat> All right. Hello, everyone. This is my first time talking at one of these, like, cool evangelical pulpits. <laughs> at my church, we have big walls, and the bishop can, like, raise it to your height, so you're just kind of hiding, just got your little eyes poking out. So this is fun. Um, my name is Shiloh Lofgren. I'll be doing introductions to the debaters and introducing the debate format. Thank you guys for spending a Friday evening to come listen to a theology discussion. Uh, I personally had to sacrifice quite a bit to be here. Had to get off work early and start my weekend early and go clear out of my way to Apollo Burger to get a Hawaiian teriyaki burger. But no, uh, all jokes aside, I don't think there's anything we could be doing that's more important than listening to a discussion about Heavenly Father and our relationship to him. I do want to thank Eric and the Utah Christian Research Center for hosting the event. And if you guys, if this is your first time being here, please take some time to look at the awesome exhibits and, and the book selection. And then uh, the bathrooms, I believe, are the first door to the left. And the code to get in is 7777. Um, all right. Uh, today we will be discussing the question, is God our literal father? Aaron Shafawalov will be arguing in the negative, and um, Devin Barnes will be arguing in the affirmative. Devin is a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a husband, a returned missionary, and an excellent example of what I want my hair to look like five or ten years from now. Uh, he's a defender of the faith and runs a popular uh, TikTok channel called Latter-day Logic. He's a skilled and experienced debater, and what I have seen from what I have seen of Devin's content, he is a concise and convincing communicator. Devin can be found, oh, sorry, Devin, can be found on all major social media channels under the name Latter-day Logic. Aaron is an evangelical Christian, a husband, a father of three, and a good friend. I am, uh, Aaron is a software programmer by day and evangelical missionary superhero by night. I am only partially joking, as me and him have had several conversations at the Provo City Center that have gone far uh, later into the night than they had the right to. It takes uh, some very frustrated wives to pull apart to theology nerds once we get talking. And I only say that joke because I got permission from my wife to say that joke. And if Aaron's wife is here, I'm sorry. Oh, right there. I'm sure you're Aaron's better half. <laughs> Aaron is extremely experienced and knowledgeable in both mainstream Christian belief and LDS belief. He has been engaging in dialogue with LDS members for the last two decades. He boasts a YouTube channel of over 20,000 subscribers, and he has advocated for mainstream Christian positions in some of the most widely watched debates between LDS members and evangelicals of all time. Um, Aaron can be found on most or all major social media networks under the name Aaron Shafawalov. If you can't spell his last name, just type in Aaron Debates Mormon and he's sure to come up. Um, the structure of the debate will be as follows. 20 minutes for each debater to give their opening statements, starting with Devin, then one hour free-flowing discussion. And with that, I will turn the time over to Devin for his 20-minute opening statement. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shiloh, and thank you, Aaron, for having me. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, I might not be able to linger on many slides for very long, so luckily this will be on YouTube later. But my purpose is to share that we are literally children of God, and that we are, you know, God is literally our Father. So if this is true, this, there's a domino effect of other truths that must also be true by implication. Uh, in order to talk about us being literal children of God, I'm going to have to touch on several of these other topics too, since they're all interconnected. We believe in a pre-mortal existence where we all were born of heavenly parents and we lived as spirits or angels in heaven. And among us, there was Jesus Christ and that he was the firstborn of all of these spirit children. We believe that there were two creations. The first creation was spiritual. God the Father created all things spiritually first before they were created physically. After the first spiritual creation, there was a grand council where Heavenly Father 
said that he would make an earth for us so we can all have a body. And we were very excited, so the Bible says we all shouted for joy. Then there was the second creation, which was physical. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the firstborn, performed the physical creation. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. How does that work, though, if, if Jesus is born from God, doesn't John 1.1 1, 1 say that the Father and the Son were together in the beginning? Well, what does the beginning mean? The Bible goes through several different events that occurred before the beginning. We don't have time to go through all of these, but this beginning is referring to the beginning of the earth's physical creation. All these events happened spiritually before the physical creation occurred. So it's not referring to the ultimate beginning. It's talking about the beginning of the physical creation of earth. Who is Jesus' God? A question that might offend many people, but it's a question that Jesus Christ himself answers when he appeared to Mary after he was resurrected and said, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God, illustrating that we share the same God. Out of the mouth of two witnesses, Peter says the same thing, that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has a Father and God. Paul and John write that Jesus Christ was the firstborn and that there are brethren or siblings born of the Spirit, referring to our premortal existence. And once again, the siblings, the sons of the resurrection, and that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead. So while we are siblings with Jesus Christ, that does not mean we are equal with Jesus Christ. We recognize humbly that there is a grand divine omnipotence that Christ possesses that we don't. The Bible teaches that the Spirit shall return unto God, the same God who gave us life. How can we return to a place we've never been before? C.S. Lewis, a non lds Christian, uh, writes that we have a lifelong nostalgia, a longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we now feel cut off. In that sense, we're all prodigals. This isn't a one-way ticket to heaven. This is a round trip that we're halfway through right now. And we have the choice, like the prodigal son, to return to our heavenly parents. And it's all possible because of Jesus Christ's atonement. Let's reflect on the creation. Notice the plural pronouns. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. The plural pronouns mean there's more than one celestial being at play here. So what does this mean? What does likeness mean? So in the creation, we see a pattern where God created all the plants and animals and everything, and everything was to reproduce according to its own kind. So that's what we understand by likeness. And then he says, let's make man in our image. So if we're following the pattern that God has established of creating things in likeness, then that would mean when he created mankind, it was more like God kind. What's interesting is in Genesis, we see some uh, uh, a Hebraism. Here it talks about the creation of Seth, Adam's son. It says Adam created Seth when he was 130 in his own likeness and image. Notice the similar word choices of image and likeness. But in Hebrew, there's no punctuation. So if you're going to quote someone, you can't put them in quotation marks. You have to rewrite what they said and invert the words. So that's why you see image and likeness first, and then in the quote, likeness and image. This is what's called an uh, inverted quotation. So here we have it in reverse order. And when you align up the quote with the original, it creates a chiasmus. So here the author of Genesis is intentionally illustrating the par parallelism that Seth is just as much a son of Adam as Adam is a son of God. And this author made it very, uh, a really intentional point to make that clear. Paul took this truth and combined it with the poets of Greece when he said that we are the offspring of God. I can't think of a more literal explanation. Yeah, we see that we're children of God. How can we be more literal? He's, and so here he makes the points. Yeah, just like what your poets have said, we're the offspring. So what is the Greek word for offspring? Uh, that's genos. 
What does genos mean in English? That means kindred, race, species, kind, stock, family. A lot of Christians are opposed to the fact that we're the same species as God. Well, then you'd be opposed to what Paul wrote in Greek. In Greek. Paul also wrote that God is the father of who? You, me, Jesus, all of the above. That he's the father of our spirits. If he created our spirits and he gave us life, then he'd be the father of our spirits. How can someone create our spirits yet not be our father from when he created us? As opposed to the, the idea of being adopted children of God later. And here's a simple diagram for the youngsters here that like begets like and that we are baby gods. We are gods in embryo. Paul wrote, and by the way, I, get, I empathize with your point. I see your point when you say uh, that we were later adopted to become children of God because here Paul writes that we shall be sons and daughters of you know, the Lord Almighty. But that is referring to Jesus Christ. We are already children of the Father when he created our spirits. We can become metaphorically children of Jesus Christ when we make a covenant to be baptized and take his name upon us. Then we become his daughters. We become born again. And now we become the children of Christ. So how can such a perfect being be the literal father of such unworthy sinners? Uh, what's interesting is some people will provide some sort of gulf between us and God to say maybe it's insulting to his glory and majesty that such unworthy sinners can be so directly related to someone so wonderful and mysterious. But the irony is in attempt to, although well-intentioned, preserve God's glory and not insult him, we end up limiting his, his power. Because God is so powerful that being related to us doesn't affect his power. So here, uh, he can be God of the galaxies and the father of our spirits, and that doesn't affect his transcendence. Think about young parents. Does a parent's intimate knowledge of their uneducated infant at all diminish their parent? Let's say these parents have PhDs. This baby doesn't know anything. That's not at all degrading or diminishing to the parent. So it's not God's greatness that struggles with such closeness, but rather our own limited understanding of what true greatness entails. Uh, what do we have at time? Ten minutes left. Okay. 11. All right. So how do we reconcile this grand difference of God's omnipotence and our nothingness while we are so closely related? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to go over this part. I'm going to skip this, but the Book of Mormon has a beautiful sermon that goes over this. Just as rivers and streams inevitably testify that there are waters higher up, the fact that we are created in male and female testifies that we have a male and female origin. A poem in our church that the thought of, of God being a single dad is a little bit ridiculous to us. It seems incomplete. So just as precious pearls can be preserved over time, we have found evidences of a divine feminine that have withstood the test of time. We are all familiar with the verse where Adam sees Eve and he says, hey, I'm going to leave my parents and I'm going you know, to be with my wife. Uh, this is coming from the perspective and point of view of Adam. Why would he say he's going to leave his mom and dad? Who could he be referring to other than his divine creators? A quick history lesson. King Josiah uh, removed a lot of figures of, of our divine mother. And in this reform, we still recovered some archaeological evidences that there is some sort of female figure that ancient Israel seemed to honor and revere. Well, Good thing we also have doctrinal archaeology or linguistic fossils. So here we have Asherah. I'm so sorry, that's so tiny. Uh, I have a, about a half dozen uh, references to in the Hebrew referring to this Asherah. Asherah is the mother of Yahweh, as it says. 
Asherah is wisdom personified in several chapters of the Bible. Uh, also referenced to Shekinah. El Shaddai and Adonai, I think, are very convincing evidences that there's a heavenly mother. I point out the A-I at the end. This is a Hebrew suffix, which is a feminine suffix. Well, that's not very convincing in and of itself, because take, for example, the word guitar. It's feminine in other languages. Well, what does El Shaddai mean in Hebrew? If you translate it directly, it's El is God, Shad is breasts, and I is the feminine suffix. The translators who read this in Hebrew, I can't, can you imagine? They're like, so what do we write? How do we write this in English? Let's just put God Almighty. That's why I put it in parentheses, because now whenever you see the phrase God Almighty, it's referencing El Shaddai in the, in the Hebrew. Uh, what's kind of interesting is the divine feminine has often been depicted as a form of a tree, sometimes a pole. Now, here we have the uh, ancient Kabbalistic uh, Jewish form of the upside-down tree of life. This has its roots in heaven and its branches on earth, symbolizing a maternal uh, nourishment, or also the path spirits take when they are born on earth, they travel from God's presence into the mother's womb. Ancient concept of the Shekinah, as mentioned on the previous slide, has been preserved on the menorah. So this tree of life figure has often been a figure for a heavenly mother, which is also symbolizing the love of God. Uh, what are we at, a time? Seven more minutes. Okay. So Peter wrote about partakers of divine nature. We have the uh, DNA strand here because if we are literally children of God, we must possess traits that God has. So here are some traits God has that we also have our capacity for love, our creative abilities, we can empathize, our moral compass and our desire to learn truth, our ability to create life, our potential to become perfect, and our potential to obtain God's glory. Here I have examples of scriptures where God possesses these and a promise that we can possess those same things too. The reason why a lot of other religions give us a lot of flack about works, we don't believe that our works save us. We believe that our works are simply learning the trade. We are children of God. We're learning how to build the shoe. We're learning how to become like God. We don't think our works are, are saving us at all, though. So just as children can inherit gifts or possessions or traits from their parents, we also receive those traits too. And uh, that's why Paul writes that we can uh, come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ by obtaining these divine Christ-like attributes. And he also writes, it looks like that same epistle, uh, that we, can, uh, we were created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Uh, okay, we don't have time to go over these gifts of the Spirit. But you may be familiar with these. These are several gifts of the Spirit, gifts that God has. Here's another slide. And gifts that we can also possess. It's actually our duty to seek after whatever gift can help alleviate wherever our moral weaknesses lie. Not only do we have several spiritual gifts, but we're also commanded to emulate Jesus Christ in all things. Here are several examples of times where we are told to follow Jesus Christ's example and to emulate his character. It's no wonder why jo uh, John said that we shall be like him when we see him. Okay, so this is another uh, pretty fascinating little nugget. Okay, so this verse, this is directly from the Greek, as you can see. So let's translate it together. Uh, so also it has been written, became the first man, Adam, uh, a soul living. The last Adam, a spirit life giving. All right, so in English, the words are maybe not in the right order as we speak today. Uh, so if we were to put it in the correct order, so also has been written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. 
the last Adam, referring to Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. Remember, in the first creation was a spiritual creation by God the Father. Jesus did not create any of our spirits. God the Father did. Jesus created all things physical. Without him was not anything made that was made. After Jesus Christ's life and resurrection, Paul writes that Jesus became a being that can create spirits. He has become like the Father. This is progression, and we see a progression all throughout the Bible. What's pretty great is that we can be joint heirs with Christ, which shows our potential that we can also become creators of spirit life. Here are several examples of progression in the Bible. What are we at with time? Three minutes. Okay, we're going to skip that. Uh, the Bible and the Book of Mormon both teach that we need to be perfect. It's a commandment. Jesus prays to the Father in John 17 that we can be perfect. He also prays that we can be unified not just with each other, but with Him and with God, the same way He is unified with the Father. And that we can receive a glorious body and that we can receive glory. Here are several examples of where God gives mortals His power. So a quick summary, in the scriptures, in the Bible, in your version of the Bible, we can receive God's knowledge and power, his wisdom, his love, compassion, his authority, his glory, perfection, spiritual gifts, all these things that you'd think would be describing God, yet these are things that we can receive. So this is, this is me and my wife in a thousand years. <laughs> The church fathers also believe that we can become gods. How do we have time? Uh, two minutes. Okay. Uh, to go over this briefly, okay, we can become gods. Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, he says we can become God. Athanasius, uh, here we, can, we might become God. Augustine, here he makes the connection that because we're sons of God, we can be made gods. That's the whole point of my presentation today. Just a martyr. Here at the end, we, at the very end, it says, uh, power to become sons of the highest. So these are some of the things that I've covered today. I don't know how much more literal it can be that we are offspring of God. We read about what offspring means in Greek. It means the same species. Uh, we are just as much children of God as Seth is a son of Adam. These are, these are straight teachings from the Bible. I find it to be very literal, but even if it were not spelled out literally, we do have the clues. Think about when you were in elementary school and you had the word problem that says, Sally has twice as many oranges as Billy. And you find out Billy has two oranges. Well, now you know how many oranges Sally has, even though it doesn't tell you ex explicitly. But you have the clues to find it out. And uh, I just want to close by saying that we can pray to know if this is true, just as Peter knew that Jesus is a son of God. He received that knowledge from God. We can also receive knowledge from God. And I testify in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Okay. I have a good dad. My literal father provided for me, showered affection on me, and loved me. A large part of who I am today is due to my dad's influence. This is me holding or him holding, my, uh, my only begotten son. I also have two adopted daughters. Um, what a privilege. A lot of who I am today is owing to my dad's influence, his character, his personality, his disposition. I know without a, without a doubt that my dad loves me, that my dad deeply cares for me. And when I think about my dad, it's really easy to think about how much God cares for me either by a good example or in some unfortunate cases of counterexample, a literal father or an adoptive father points us to a greater father, namely God himself. God is the archetypal father, the original father, and the father of all fatherhood. All other fatherhood is ectypal. Ectypal means derivative, lesser, finite, limited, inferior, but pointing to something greater. The ectype points to the archetype. Paul says in Ephesians 3, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Heaven and earth, not just earth, heaven and earth. Notice the Greek wordplay. 
God is the patera of all patria. He is the father of all family, and he is the father of all fatherhood. Drawing from the Bible, historic Christianity has affirmed at least four ways in which God is father. God the Father, speaking of the person of the Father, is the Father of the eternally only begotten Son. He's also the Father of all creation, that God, as God, is the, He's also the Father of all creation. And thirdly, God, as God, is the Father of all special creation, humanity. And finally, God is the redemptive Father, I should put it a capital F there, of adoptive, adopted sons. On the first, from Scripture, Christians observe that even before creation, and to be clear, in the New Testament, creation is of things visible and invisible, things on earth and heaven. Even before creation, the sun was already the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, the very power and wisdom of God, and the very word of the Father. These things were true even before anything sequential or creative. The Father, John says, has life in himself, Jesus says this. So also, he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And also, you all know this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So, God gave his only begotten Son. The Son did not become the only begotten in being given or sent or becoming flesh. Already the only begotten Son, he was given. This view is called eternal sonship and eternal generation. Early Mormonism took a different view called incarnational sonship. In this view, it was the taking of a tabernacle or flesh that, the, that, that, um, that God became the son. In the Book of Mormon, we read, and because he dwelleth in flesh, he shall be called the son of God. You can see this in the lectures on faith as well, where the father is described as a personage of spirit and the son, a personage of tabernacle. So this very early literature defines sonship in terms of tabernacling or having a body. Joseph Smith teached in 1843, taught in 1843. Joseph Smith, sorry, I'm sorry, that was a Freudian slip. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ is the heir of this kingdom the only begotten of the Father according to the flesh. Please don't let my humor distract you from the point. In Smith's view, the only begotten is the only begotten according to the flesh, after the manner of the flesh. The second sense in which God is, uh, as God is Father, and this is speaking of Father, Son, and Spirit, this really isn't limited to the person of the Father, is his being creator of all. Paul writes in Romans 11, for from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be glory forever. Amen. And in Revelation, 24, in Revelation 4, the, 20, the, is it the 24 elders, the 24 elders worship God in Revelation saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive all glory and honor and power for you created all things, all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Latter-day Saint theology, in contrast, reduces creation to the rearrangement of eternally pre-existing pieces. Summarizing predominant LDS thought, philosopher, this is a Mormon philosopher, Blake Osler, he insists that God did not create the ultimate things of the cosmos. He writes, quote, the Mormon God did not bring into being the ultimate constituents of the cosmos, neither its fundamental matter nor the space-time matrix, which define it. Such realities include inherently self-directing selves, primordial elements, the natural laws which structure reality and moral principles. None of that, according to LDS philosophers, was created by God. The third sense in which God is Father is that he made humanity in his image. Preaching to the Athenians, Paul reappropriates their poetry. Quote, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. That we are the very offspring of God, for Paul entails that our innermost being depends on God for its very existence. God made our being, and he preserves our being. Apart from him, we would not even exist. Apart from that, sorry, and not only that, <laughs> he created us to image him. Genesis 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So 
Mankind is the apex, the pinnacle, the, I've heard this, the crown jewel of creation. It's only after creating, creating men and women that God says of creation, it is what? Very good. God celebrates the special creation of man. Various Christian explanations have been given for what it means to be in the image of God. They tend to focus on our unique internal faculties, our spiritual capacities, our nature, our relationality, our emotions, our moral life, our spirituality, our free will. Essentially, our ability to have relationship with God and to represent him to mankind and to the rest of creation as we fulfill the creation mandate to be fruitful, to multiply, and to take dominion over the earth. That we are in God's image is substantial and not merely superficial. I'll put it this way. It's about attributes, not eyelashes. My favorite quote on the image of God in man comes from Herman, Herman Bavink, who, wrote, who writes, Image tells us that God is the archetype, humanity the actype. Likeness adds the notion that the image corresponds in all parts. That's my main point to the, in the debate here. In all parts to the original. This does not refer to certain attributes, either on God's side or ours, such as the intellect or the soul. He means merely. But rather that the whole human person is in the image of the whole deity. Joseph Smith taught that God was fundamentally unable to create the inner being of man, teaching, quote, God never had the power to create the spirit of man at all. And early, uh, well, uh, LDS historians note that Smith is using spirit, mind, soul, intelligence, synonymously as an individual. Contemporaries of Joseph Smith immediately after his death, but also shortly before his death, began to extrapolate a doctrine of literal sonship via premortal begetting of heavenly parents. And it, these early leaders were, you know, they were pretty specific. Uh, Orson Pratt even suggested a nine-month gestation. So it's, it's language suggestive of a kind of celestial coitus or copulation or something suggestive or analogous or similar to it with celestial pregnancy and then uh, some sort of spirit birth. They uh, are synthesizing a number of early and late teachings of Joseph Smith. One, that all things were created spiritually before naturally. And mind you, this is not merely speaking of man. This is referring to all things, including vegetables. Two, that man is eternal in some sense. Latter-day Saint uh, scholars, some of them at least, say that in the early LDS text, scripture, writings, this is referring to an ideal or conceptual existence in the mind of God, whereas a late Latter-day Saint idea is that we exist independent of the thoughts of God, a mind independent. That's what Osler calls it, a mind independent existence. So, so some of this uh, early scripture from Latter-day Saint distinctive text is being reappropriated to mean something very different. And also the continuation of seeds and the famous polygamy passage, the idea is that the exalted gods will continue the seeds. I'm aware of four competing Latter-day Saint approaches to this. Brigham Young taught that individuals have their genesis at spirit birth, being begotten by heavenly parents, and he's very clear this is not two parents, this is heavenly father and many more than one wife, from eternal impersonal uh, spirit element. In this view, man as a self has his genuine beginning at spirit birth. This view was continued by Charles Penrose, Joseph Fielding Smith, Bruce McConkie. Orson Pratt argued that individual spirit Premortal spirits were begotten by heavenly parents from collections of conscious particles, each of which are self-directing. It's almost like a corporate person or the coalescing of the collection of self-directing intelligence particles that end up being begotten uh, in some sort of uh, sexually analogous act to the begetting of a spirit child. Shared by Orson Pratt, Leon Skousen, and then if I could, I'm allowed to include an author, <laughs> Orson Scott Card, fiction writer, but he kind of picks up on the idea. Did I say... Clear? Yeah, okay. yeah. So B.H. Roberts popularized the view that intelligences were eternal individualism, sorry, eternal individuals. This is called eternal personalism, entailing a premortal begetting or spirit birth that constituted the clothing of a spirit body. In this view, the eternal self is expanded or you might say upgraded at spirit birth. He, did not, he or she did not have their beginning here, but really were sort of clothed or expanded at this event. This view was shared by John Witso, James Talmadge, Truman Madsen. Um, it's the predominant LDS view today in the LDS culture and top down, uh, most sort of, it's the most presumed view in LDS literature. LDS philosopher Blake Osler notes that spirit, soul, mind, and intelligence are synonymous in Smith's public sermons, and that we 
Instead, we're adopted in premortality, not literally begotten. This view attempts to retrieve a kind of pre-Brigham retro-Mormonism and rejects the interpretation of Smith's contemporaries. Also, Osler essentially rejects nearly all the post-Joseph Smith prophetic LDS tradition on the issue. If, I could, if you'll allow me a joke, um, it's as though the BYU Apologetics Club uh, should sing, we thank the O God for a, what is it supposed to be? Philosopher. Philosopher. That's, okay. <laughs> This view is uh, taken by Peter Carmack at BYU-Idaho and an author, LDS author, who wrote a, an article in this, uh, a journal article, who's a smart guy, Samuel M. Brown. I take my opponent today to take the view of B.H. Roberts, that the individual is eternal, was not begotten into existence, but rather clothed or expanded with the spirit body when begotten by a heavenly father and a wife. The final sense in which God is father is that of a redemptive father of adopted and born again sons and daughters. You can see this in John 1, which reads, to all who did receive him, he gave the right, sorry, he, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Notice the gavel dropping here three times, not, nor, nor. It's essentially not literal, not literal, not literal. Born of God instead. Now, there is a rich and long LDS prophetic and cultural tradition of using Romans 8.16. I didn't see it in any of your slides. That was really curious. Maybe it was there and I missed it. it uh, they take this verse very, very commonly among Latter-day Saint top leaders to teach that we are literal sons and daughters of heavenly parents, entailing, again, something analogous to celestial copulation, celestial pregnancy, spirit birth. I mean, it's just sort of a, a range of how far you want to take the, the literal idea. So I've asked the LDS missionaries on my couch, is this referring to literal pre-mortal spirit begetting of the universal birthing of all of our spirits by heavenly parents? Yes. Is it, not, is it referring to adoption? No. I'll just take them to two prior verses. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God for ye. You have not received the spirit of bondage, a good to fear, but you have what? Received the spirit of Adoption. For Christians, the intuitive sense we have of belonging to God, the assurance that we have of being loved by God, and the confidence we have in our being to cry out to God, Abba, Father. It's not owing to something analogous to or suggestive of celestial copulation between exalted demigods or supermen. It's not owing to celestial pregnancy or to a celestial spirit birth. It's not owing to God having a wife or wives. It's owing to having received the spirit of adoption. Receiving the Holy Spirit on account of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That is the foundation of me crying out to God, Abba, Father. To summarize the difference, I would say that Mormonism takes a superficial view of fatherhood and sonship. While Christianity takes a substantial view of fatherhood and sonship. And if, if you'll walk away with nothing else, please walk away with this. In Mormonism, divine fatherhood and sonship are external, especially in the B.H. Roberts view. Sorry to point at you, I'm just taking the B.H. Roberts view. In the Roberts view, God did not, fa he did not father into existence by creation or begetting all of who the son originally was. He only did so with his he only organized his spirit body, uh, and in some sense, his mortal body. God did not create the original individual self of anyone in the B.H. Roberts' dominant view. Intelligence are seen as co-eternal, not created or begotten. God, in this view, did not create the original potential of spirit element, nor author eternal laws. In this view, especially if you take the view, it's not stereotypical, but it's dominant in Latter-day Saint tradition, that the father has a father, that there's a spirit grandfather. That's not a crazy idea. It's very, it's easy to find with Latter-day Saint uh, leadership, uh, historic teachings. That makes the father not the father of all fatherhood. It makes him downstream. It makes him ectypal. It makes him not the archetype. It makes him downstream from other fathers. He's not the father of all fathers. He's not the father in this LDS Roberts view He's not the father of all fatherhood. He's not the source of our original existence. 
He's not the source of our original potential, and he's not the source of our innermost self. He did not father any of that into existence in this B.H. Roberts view. But for Jesus, that God created the innermost part of man is ethically significant. This is him excoriating the Pharisees. Did he who made, made the outside, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? If God did not create our innermost self, then Jesus' point is infinitely lessened. You get that, the point here? In the B.H. Roberts literal father view, God did not create your innermost self. He did not beget your innermost self, and he did not father your innermost self into existence. You already were. God is better than a literal father. He didn't send us a mere chronological firstborn spirit brother of Satan. God gave us his word, the word, right? The image of the invisible God, Paul's, Paul calls him. The radiance of his glory. The very, Paul calls, he, he's talking about the divine feminine and wisdom. Paul calls in 1 Corinthians, who is the wisdom and power of God? Paul knows what he's doing. He's picking up on Proverbs 8. Who does Jesus call the wisdom of God? Sorry, who does Paul call the wisdom of God? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We have something infinitely better than a literal father. Being a literal child, I'll say of demigods, because they're not archetypal, they're not ultimate. Being literal children of demigods in a marvel-like cosmos of exalted supermen is inferior compared to being the image-bearing adopted children of the most high God, all right? If you were the son of Superman, that'd be cool, right? If you're the son, the literal son of a demigod who isn't necessarily the first God. I guess there's some value in that. But if you are an image bearer of the most high, the first father, the father of all fatherhood, from whom are all things, that is an infinite higher, infinitely higher dignity. We, so fatherhood in Mormonism ends up being merely additive, expansive. But the God of the Bible is a substantial father in infinitely greater ways. Believers have a relationship with the Father of all fathers, the Most High. He created us in His substantial image. He gave us His only begotten Son and adopted us into permanent union and forgiveness and eternal life. This is the significance of 1 John 3. It's not spirit birth. It's in light of who God is, Father, Son, Spirit. In light of us being under a Creator who created everything, in light of us being special creations in the image of God, in light of us still being rebels, corrupt, carnal, dark, God adopted us as his sons. And that is an infinitely better blessing and gift and honor and dignity than being the literal spirit child of a demigod exalted Superman. Everyone, we'll be getting back into it. 60 minutes of free-flowing discussion. Well, that was fun. I, I, it seems like you did a lot of research. Yes. Yeah, maybe more than, than, than what I did. Like, you're, you're teaching me about my own religion. Oh. I was yes. like, oh, okay. I guess we believe that. Um, well, thank you for being here, too. I know, <laughs> um, to be honest, finding an apologist who takes the Roberts view who's willing to publicly defend that view is a treat for me because a lot of the Latter-day Saint apologetics community is going in the other direction. So does that make sense? I, I view the, the Roberts position as more traditionalistic, a traditionalist, so I appreciate having a representative of Latter-day Saint traditionalism. So. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, uh, I, I haven't read anything by, by Osler, but if we, if we agree, then cool. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I do have a, a couple of questions uh, for, these are dumb questions, uh, just because I, I know a lot about my religion, but not others. So in our religion, we have, we believe in prophets and apostles and a, a defined lexicon of, you know, defined doctrines and what they mean. Mm. And so there's a lot of structure and organization. So in your religion, let's say you don't believe we are literally children of God. And again, this is a dumb question. What happens if you just believe it anyway? 
yeah, let's say let's say it's not in the Bible at all. What happens if you say you believe it? Yeah, like well, if you were to just like why not why not just believe it? Um, I would, if someone said that, I would ask them what literal means. I'd ask them what they mean by it, and I'd want to know what other doctrines are affected by it because it usually comes in a package. And when you pull that thread, I think you'd agree here too. It's never in isolation; it's always in a system, mm -hmm. right? So. Uh, the idea that we're literal children, like, like you pointed out in one of your slides, systematically uh, gives rise to a, a whole new worldview. Oh, the dominoes? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think what would help at a friendly level or at a pastoral or kind level is just to pull that thread a bit and help someone understand how much of a different worldview they might have from historic Christianity and how much that diverges from the local church that they're uh, worshiping at. So you're saying you would not believe it because when you look at all of scripture as a whole, it seems to tell a story that agrees with each other. Right, it systematically opposes the idea of us being literal children. Mm -hmm. It's not merely a few proof texts, it's the yeah. whole arc. Yes, and I'm glad you pointed out the adoption verse and uh, how we can become children of God. And I think I've identified the, the wedge that divides our viewpoints, and that was because we believe the Father and the Son are different people, that they are one in unity and purpose, just like my wife and I are one. But obviously they're more unified. So we can become children of Christ. Christ is also God, because God is a title. So if we can become children of God, in a sense that's referring to Christ through our conversion and being born again, then we are adopted as children of God. So when you say, are we adopted children of God, I say, yes. Who are you referring to, the Father or the Son? Do you think there's any sense in which the Father adopts his spirit kids? No, not, the, not Elohim, not the Father. I think that we are literal spirit children of God uh, because Jesus Christ is the firstborn. And I shared several verses about him being the firstborn and how that he has brethren and, and siblings. So the question is, what do we understand to be literal, and what do we understand to be a metaphor? Because Jesus used a lot of metaphors and parables. Mm -hmm. So where do you draw the line in, this is metaphor, this is literal, like uh, the Father and I are one, it sounds like you take more of a literal belief than what the Latter-day Saints do, right? When you say literal, what do you mean? I think that's a pretty, maybe we should pull that thread just a little bit. Mm -hmm. What does literal mean? I, I would go with the dictionary definition of literal. Help me out. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, I don't know. Can we <laughs> phone a friend? I think that it, uh, when I say literal, I'm saying, yeah, if we're children of God, then he is our father. Yeah. I'm not trying to, like, stump you because, like, sometimes definitions on fundamental things are kind of hard to get underneath those. It's so, like, what's an, el what's an element? What's, a, what's an idea? Like, so, yeah. Ph ph fundamental philosophical questions are really hard. So, uh, no. Uh, not a big deal there, but literal in this discussion about whether we're literal children of the Heavenly Father seems to have the rhetorical weight of mapping almost exactly onto an earthly pattern. Is that fair? Uh, yeah, so we're patterned after the, the pre-existence, right? Is that what you're getting at? That literal corresponds to the earthly category um, Almost exactly. Is that fair? It's like it's, like it's modeled after. Um, oh, you're talking about uh, archetype and ectype? Literal in the LDS currency of sort of common theological language. What does that mean? God is our literal father. We are literal children. What, is, what does literal mean? Yeah, I think that God created our spirits. He created our spirit life. Okay? So my dad here and my mom, they created my physical life. So they're my parents. So... You know, I believe that our heavenly parents created our spirit life. I don't know the logistics of it, but I know that they created my spirit life. Spirit birth, at least? Uh, you know, that's, I, I like to stick with what's established doctrine. So the Roberts view, as I take it, as I understand it, does at least affirm spirit birth. That's, that's the whole discussion, right? Is yeah. Whether or not spirit birth is a part of the, the category, right? Yeah, and... Uh, my assumption going into this is that you took the Roberts view and affirmed spirit birth. That's a very, that's a very common mm -hmm. affirmation from Latter-day Saint leaders. 
That's not in the like the weird Orson Pratt, um, give it even further out mm -hmm. literal uh, specifications, but just at a basic level. Yeah, Spirit. I believe that we were we were born and raised in heaven. Uh, but that that is the extent of the revelation. There's a 1909 origin of man statement. I'm saying that's the extent of the doctrine. Meaning? So there are some, uh, we believe that man is fallible. So if you find a quote from Orson Pratt who says, uh, we're, uh, Heavenly Mother is pregnant for nine months. Yeah. I'm like, hey, that's his opinion. It's an apostolic opinion. So? Okay. Yeah, I don't care if he's an apostle. Uh, we believe in the fallibility of man. God is infallible. And when God speaks, those words are infallible. As soon as it's heard by a fallible man and written down and copied and maybe translated. So, you know, so can I, as an outsider, read the 1909 Origin of Man statement endorsed by the First Presidency, the 1916 uh, First Presidency statement on the Father and the Son, and the 1995 Proclamation on the Family as at least reliable and faithful descriptions of Latter-day Saint teaching? Just like what you said, systematically, yeah, you... you pull them together. So the 1909 statement says he's begotten, uh, born, and reared. I think those are the three verbs. Is that fair? Is that a fair summary of what the Roberts view is and what the view you take? Yeah. So what does begotten mean in that context? I would say born. Not conceived? Sure, conceived. What is, I, what is conceived mean? I mean, if we're going to be literal, why not let the weight of the term sink like what, or, or hit? Like what, why withdraw from the power of the term literal? What does it mean to be conceived? I don't withdraw from the power of the term. I withdraw because we're venturing here into the weeds, and I'd like to stick to what is doctrinally established by the church because I'd like to, I don't want to speculate, especially since this is going to be on the Internet. So uh, I believe that we were born and raised in heaven, and, and that to, I think your, your viewpoint of, oh, we're adopted by God, that's better than being his child, which, by the way, literal I, child. Sure. Yeah. But I don't appreciate that what you said about this whole demigod Superman thing. I think that was a jab, and that was disrespectful to my beliefs. I, I would, I, I would, I, I gave you respect with your beliefs. Mm. I want that. I don't want you to call us demigod Superman. I want you to treat me like a spirit brother that I am. Can you understand why I would say demigod? I, I see your your opinion, uh, but not archetypal not ultimate, not most high, not first, not original. So anything less would be demi. Very descriptive. Obviously, there's a, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm not being neutral when I say that. I'm being, I'm being evaluative and very critical. I'm, I'm condemning that idea is that, that our God would be downstream from other gods, that kind of thing, or that our God is within the system, not over the system. That definitionally means he's a demigod. That's, that's why I would use the term. And you, it sounds like you're implying that if, if God is one of many gods, mm -hmm. he's somehow less than your view of God. It means he, I mean, in the, in the Latter-day Saint framework, typically, it means that he learned to become God, received what he has, is among others that can be compared to him, in some views, downstream from other ancestral gods or uh, heavenly grandfather and so forth. Yeah, that, that violates the criteria of, say, Isaiah, putting God, uh, exalting God as the unique, incomparable, never learned, most high, first and the last, only God, who alone is uniquely worthy of our worship. Well, your words, when I asked you, why not just believe that we're little children of God, your response was, you look at it systematically mm -hmm. and see what it says as a whole. If you isolate Isaiah and you ignore other verses that seem to, we, we, clearly went over some verses that say that Jesus, in the Greek, is now creating spirit life and that we can become perfect, that we can become one with Jesus the same way Jesus is one with the Father, we'll be one with them. We can receive God's glory, his power, his knowledge, all these things to refresh what I went over. So if we can receive all those things, and then when Jesus Christ, being the Son of God, and the Pharisees said, oh, that's blasphemy, He's like, doesn't your own scripture say that you are gods? How can mm -hmm. me saying that I'm a son of God be more blasphemous than what you have? Yeah, let's, so, pull, that. let's pull that thread. Yeah. So obviously, if, if all these things are true, 
and that we can become one in God and receive, become joint heirs with Christ. What has Christ received? What is a joint heir? Let, let's s slow down on the John 10 passage, if you don't mind. Jesus says, is it not written, ye are gods? He's quoting Psalm 82, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be like the gods of Psalm 82? I don't know what you're referring to. Do you think that the role model, do you think Jesus, when he says ye are gods, is speaking in an optimistic, potential, positive kind of way? Well, think about the context of what Jesus is speaking in. So we have the writings of the Psalms. I don't know the context of that Psalm, but I do know the context of what Jesus is talking about. In that context, he's being accused of blasphemy for being mm -hmm. the son of God. So he's saying, hey, this isn't blasphemy. We, we are gods. We, we've already- You didn't say we. He said, ye is are it, gods. Is it not written ye uh -huh. are gods? Appropriating, quoting yeah. Psalm 82, right? Yeah. So my point is that in Psalm 82, the gods are condemned to die like men. They're ungodly. They uh, abuse their position. They're um, not good candidates for exaltation by Latter-day Saint standards. The audience that Jesus has in John 10, who are accusing him of blasphemy as he uniquely identifies himself with the Father, are neither good candidates for exaltation. I, I'm assuming you don't think I should want to be like the audience of Jesus in John 10, nor do you think I should want to be like the gods of Psalm 82. We should be like Jesus. Yes, mm -hmm. by, by, as an ectypal imitation, mm -hmm. seeking to follow him and imitate him, mm -hmm. not seeking to receive worship. Well, I mean, worship will probably come along with it, but we shouldn't seek for the worship. If, if it's a part of the final plan, why not seek it? Uh, why, because why withdraw from it? If it's such a glorious final destination or final state, mm -hmm. why not consciously seek it? For the same reason why I don't want to become a dad so I can be admired by my kids. Why not? Because I don't want to be a dad for that reason. I want to be a dad so I can provide life for, you know, my, my wife and I were maybe going to have a baby next year. We're crossing our fingers. Praise God. Okay. Yeah. So if, if I'm going to become a dad, my motivation isn't like Michael Scott from The Office so more people can like me and adore me. Sure, but when I seek to have children, or did, I had only begotten son, two adopted daughters, wanting to have a mutual love relationship with them was part of the package. I wanted them to admire me, and I wanted to love them. I want them to reverence me, and I want to care for them. I, well, wa I want them to like me, and mm -hmm. I want to like them. That's not, it's, a, it's, okay to want your, it's okay to want your kids to, want to like you. That's well, not, that's not, there's not sh nothing shameful there. This was a fallacy, that what you just said. Sure. I said, I'm not seeking worship. And you're saying, it's okay to want to be liked by your kids. We're shifting the goalposts here. It's worse in the Latter-day Saint framework if you hold that when you become an exalted God, you will receive worship from your own spirit children. Yeah, as a byproduct of being a God. Right, so I don't want my kids to worship me. This is where I think the Latter-day Saint mm -hmm. metaphor breaks down. Don't you want your kid, don't you want, you know, it's kind of a, you know, we are literal children of God and our potential corresponds to that. Don't you want your kids to become great? I want my kids to become greater than me, Yeah. but I don't want my kids to worship me. Mm -hmm. That's what makes God different. He doesn't want me to become greater than him because everything I have will always come from him. He wants me to be in relationship with him and worship him. It's okay for God to tell me to worship him. It's okay. It's not conceded for God to command me to um, worship him as God. This is where I, if I were to treat my kids like that, if I were to, if I were to demand, if I were to, require worship from my children, uh, that would be, if I were to act like a god to my kids, in that sense, mm -hmm. I'd be a bad parent. If I'm not the ultimate god of the universe, then the only way I can parent my children is to point them to a greater archetypal father. I can point them to a greater, I'm not the final law. I'm not the final word. God is the final word. Mm -hmm. I administer a higher law. Mm -hmm. So if God has a god, if the father has a father, mm -hmm then he ought not be telling us to worship him. He ought not be telling us to obey him as the final object of authority or obedience. He should be pointing us to upstream the first God there ever was, the archetypal father of all fatherhood. I think that's another fallacy because you're comparing our imperfect self as a father to a perfect father. And you're saying, I wouldn't want my children to worship me. And you say, I want my children to become greater than me. Mm. 
this is a false equivalency because we're not God. So why would we want our children to worship us? I agree with you, but that's not the point that we're talking about. If you said you want your kids to become greater than you, yeah. why? Because I'm created. Because God is greater than both of us. Because I'm not God. Okay. Because, because I love them as a creature, and the best way to love other creatures is to, is to want the best for them in the relationship with God. Okay, all right, great. I'm not the center of the universe. I, right. If I was, I'd be a bad dad. So you love your kids, so you want the best for them. You want them to achieve more than what you have achieved. Yeah. So what would you think about a parent who didn't want their child to achieve as much as what they have achieved? They'd be a bad creational parent. Mm -hmm. They'd be a bad human. Mm -hmm. But if God wanted us to have relationship with him where we look to him as the source of everything, good, true, and beautiful, where we are what we are by partaking in him, imitating him, him is the archetype, dependence on him, um, that's okay. I, I, I once saw an LDS blog post, when we become gods, does God want us to become, does he want us to mature beyond dependence? Does he want us to kind of leave the home? I mean, how, how far does the Genesis 1 I mean, you were quoting Genesis 1 as a connection point to heavenly parents. But that passage, that passage is about children leaving the home and exiting their dependence on their parents, exiting the same kind of submission authority relationship they have with their parents. If I extend that analogy further, then when I become a god, I stop being dependent on God. I stop reverencing him as God, and I stop worshiping him as God if in that Latter-day Saint analogous framework. I, I leave the circle of dependence. In the Christian view of our future, the glorious future of the sons of God is growing in our dependence on God, growing in our joy of utter dependence on everything that God is. What would you need to depend on God for once you're perfect? Um, because all perfection comes from God. It's sustained by, governed by, and preserved by God. And you believe you will be pump, will, you'll become perfect? In the sense of being morally pure, in the sense of being the uh, coming to maturity in what I was meant to be according to my creaturely nature. Not in the sense that I can say, I've never learned, I've never received, people can worship me now. My own spirit kids can call me the most holy God. Not yeah. in that sense. Yeah, we don't agree with that either. Uh, the we has a lot of diversity there. Yeah, it depends on who you talk to. But never learned? Um, can a God who learned tell his future spirit children that he never learned? I think it depends here on the context. What are you referring to when he says he never learned? Isaiah 40 verse, sorry, 14, 15, 16. It's in that range. Um, God says he never learned. He's never been taught. He's never been counseled. So part of what makes God uniquely worthy of worship, part of what makes him not a literal father is that he is what he is by his own nature and not by obtainment. He didn't become what he is. He's never learned, and all knowledge comes from him. I can't learn to be the kind of being that never learned. I think that you're interpreting this single verse out of context. God certainly did learn, because if, unless, of course, he was always God, then, then we're just speculating. But sure, we can learn, and then we can become perfect. You believe that, you, that we can become perfect? Depends what you mean by it. Yeah. Well. Perfect means complete, right? Complete according to our human nature, not a complete according to God's own nature. Mm -hmm. Completeness and perfection for God means never learned, never received, all things are from him, through him, to him. I, I would disagree. Okay. Um, I don't think that you can use that definition, even though here in Isaiah he says, I've never learned, you can't say that's what perfect means because you can become perfect and learn it. Say, for example, Jesus Christ, he's always been perfect. Mm -hmm. But we read in the Greek that he is now creating spirit beings. That he is creating spirit beings? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15.45 in the Greek says that Jesus Christ is now giving life to spirits. Okay, it's different than creating spirit beings in the Latter-day Saint sense. I, in fact, if I could remind you, Joseph Smith said that God doesn't have the power to create spirits. You know, not everything Joseph Smith says is infallible. Uh, when you, you, you have to take into account, sometimes people make mistakes. I'm not saying that's untrue. I'm just saying to say that God doesn't have the power to do something would go against God's nature of being omnipotent, the very definition of I being omnipotent. totally agree. Great. 
that puts you at odds with a lot of Latter-day Saint LDS prophetic tradition and LDS philosophers and LDS apologists. Mm -hmm. can, can God create matter? I don't know. According to LDS prophetic tradition, can God create matter? I don't know. Can God create the individual original intelligence of man? Maybe. Can, did God create eternal law? I think eternal law, I, can he? Did he? Did he? I think eternal law already existed. Okay, so Osler's quote up there said, in Mormon theology, God didn't create, um, I'm sorry to paraphrase, primordial spirits, or uh, sorry, primordial, primordial spirit element, individuals, intelligences, original spirits in their original sense, and he didn't create the fundamental stuff of matter. He, another, according to LDS prophetic tradition and according to LDS philosophy, God didn't create any of that. So I'm, I'm happy to hear you say, well, maybe he did, because it opens the door to a whole new theology. That, mm. that, that is a, that's explosive. That's great. Well, I'm not, I'm not trying to be snide when I say that. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, like when I hear a Latter-day Saint say on the street, maybe God never was a sinner. Maybe he's the first God. Maybe he never learned. Mm -hmm. It's like very promising to me. I'm like, oh, I don't want to criticize that. I, like, hold yeah. on to that. Don't, as you, re, as you fr further go down the path of LDS apologetics, don't give that kind of thing up. Maybe mm. God did create matter. Maybe God did create the original self. Yeah, well, I think that you're looking at Scripture through a specific lens. Where you Are you sola scriptura? Yeah. So you want to see it in the Bible for you to believe it. Either explicitly or based on. Okay. So you're saying that there's no truth that exists that's at least hinted at in the Bible. No, I... Um, some of theology comes from the immediate first pass reading of what scripture explicitly says, and some of it's second pass, 1,000 you know, laps through scripture, and you start inferring a systematic framework from scripture based on, all, so we say scripture interprets scripture. So you, you, this is why Christian history is, is progressive for me, um, where the church is growing and learning and reflecting on scripture, and God is gifting it, uh, God's people. To, to reflect upon scripture and growing in our uh, unity, growing in our knowledge. It's, it's, it's great. Um, sorry, I forgot the So I, I'm, I guess I, my question was, do you believe that there's truth that exists that's not at least hinted at in the Bible? Infinite amount of truth, yeah. Okay, so there's lots of truth that is true, right? And it's not in the Bible. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secrets uh, of the Lord belong to him alone but that which he has revealed is for us and our children forever. Okay. This is the mysteries of God, right? Yeah. Okay. So since you believe that there is truth and it's a mystery, it's not in the Bible, it can still be true. So if Joseph Smith, for example, were to say something that doesn't conflict with the Bible, but it's new, why reject it just based on the fact that it's not in the Bible when you just said that there is truth outside the Bible? It, what claim are you thinking of? I'm just in general. Can you give an example? Uh, that we can become gods? In the sense of becoming those who have never learned? Or let's go with uh, being children of God. That's the topic, right? Mm -hmm. In what sense? Okay, uh, in the B.H. Roberts sense, maybe, or maybe I'm not sure. Not adopted. Spirit birthed. Um, yeah, spirit birthed. That we were eternal in the B.H. Roberts sense, that we didn't have a beginning that we were not birthed into existence, we were not created into existence. I'm saying that we were born and raised in heaven from heavenly parents. Born and raised meaning we were expanded to have a spirit body and then that's subsequent to being an internal intelligence individual. So the, I'm just setting it up for clarity. I'm saying the layman, the layman's term, did, were we born spiritually in heaven? Well, it just depends what you mean. That's the whole discussion. <laughs> Latter-day Saint scholars, when they read, for example, um, about spiritual creation mm -hmm. in early Latter-day Saint scripture, or DNC 76 about being children of God, they note that this doesn't look like it's spirit birth. It doesn't look like the B.H. Roberts model. In, in fact, this whole notion of wanting to be doctrinal, wanting to stick with official doctrine, um, wanting to be uh, safe in, in a sense of resting upon the standard works and not following the speculations of man, that kind of, that, that idea of minimizing your doctrinal framework to what is stable, right? That's what leads people down the path of Blake Osler. That, they go down that path and then realize, oh, 
there is no explicit teaching in the Old, New, Old, Old or New Testament or any distinctive Latter-day Saint scripture on spirit birth by Heavenly Mother. None of that. None of that. This is, this is why I feel like you're, you're fighting an uphill battle. You're not merely contending with me. You're not merely contending with LDS, uh, with Christian tradition. You're contending with LDS apologetics. You're, con you're contending with Brigham Young. Right? You, by taking the B.H. Roberts model, you're saying that Brigham Young, Charles Penrose, Orson Pratt, uh, Anthon Lund, James Talmadge, um, Joseph Fielding Smith, Bruce McConkie, all of these men are wrong. So they don't think that we were born spiritually? When they, they teach that. They reject the Roberts model in that the spirit birth constitutes the genuine beginning of the self. It's not the B.H. Roberts model. The B.H. Roberts model is that spirit birth constitutes the expansion or clothing an existing eternal self to be more than what they were, but they were already individuals. You're saying that these people did not believe we had intelligences? They defined intelligence uh, differently. That's, that was the whole argument. That's that intelligence, spirit, uh, mind, soul. There, there's an equivocation or there's yeah. a difference of meaning. Sometimes they will, they will use the word intelligence synonymous with spirit, and other times they'll say intelligence as the term as what you're saying Blake Osler uses. So light of truth, individual existence, or the substance of the of spirit element. Those are the three categories, right? You know, I think that you have zoomed in the microscope so far that you have eliminated other possible interpretations. So you are compartmentalizing these definitions, but I, I know examples where intelligences have been used in different, used with different definitions. Yeah. So you can't just stick with one. I'm not disagreeing with you. Oh, I'm saying there's a range of meaning. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, so having the range of meaning in mind and looking at the larger context of what these leaders teach, I'm actually looking at the range of LDS options. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know of any other major option than the option I've listed. Yeah, so I think your claim, going back to what you said about how I'm disagreeing with all the lists of people you just said, yeah. that's according to your interpretation of what they said according to the words they used. Okay, just to make sure we're on the same page, do you understand the four major categories of, of the Osler view, the Young view, the Roberts view, and the Pratt view? What I, I, I don't spend my time looking at different interpretations. I look at just the fact that we have intelligences. If, if, I, if I die, my body goes down, my spirit is here. Mm -hmm. You know, remove the body, here's the spirit. Mm -hmm. You remove the spirit, you have the intelligence. Which is? I don't know. So if, if, the, if what you mean by that final state, when you, when you boil it down to sort of the onion, right? If the inner part is a, an uncreated person, or an individual, or a mind, or an ego, then what you have is you have either the, uh, either the Osler model or the Roberts model. Mm -hmm. In the Young model, uh, intelligence is not, when you get down to it, um, an eternal, unbegotten person. There, there was no individual that was self-existent prior to spirit begetting. In the young Penrose, Lund, uh, Fielding Smith, McConkie model, you didn't always exist except in the sense of the spirit element from which you were begotten. You as an individual, as a mind or as an ego, or as a person, did not always exist. You began your existence genuinely at spirit birth. That's why, that's why I was sending you links earlier, just about mm -hmm. to, to make sure we're on the same page. When you take the Roberts model that you, you just did, you just did, that's, that's the Roberts model, you're basically saying that these Latter-day Saint, by implication, that these Latter-day Saint leaders are wrong. And no. yeah, it's about no. that, about the, eternal, no, because, about the nature um, of spirit birth. So I, I see what you're saying. So when, when people will quote and say, we were born spiritually and that's when our life began, we, we acknowledge the existence of intelligences, but because we know literally nothing about it, just than the fact that it's eternal and it's already existed, uh, there's, there's not a lot to expound on. So these quotes you're going off of that say, uh, this is where life began spiritually, you're assuming that they're rejecting any form of intelligence prior. You mean by, by intelligence, do you mean individual existence of persons? See, that's the thing. I don't even know how to define intelligence. Okay, so, so we don't beat a dead horse or bore our audience. Yeah. I would just recommend 
um, the audience and the viewership. There is a book called Line Upon Line, where Van Hale has a chapter on the early history of Latter-day Saint thought on, on spirit birth intelligence as a preexistence. Yeah, but that's just speculation, right? Like, what that's authority history. does that have? Uh, he just talks about the different Latter-day Saint views. Blake Osler has a really good essay online on the, the development of the doctrine of preexistence in Latter-day Saint thought. Um, Brent Topp, uh, BYU guy. Roger Terry, BYU guy. Just read your own stuff. Mm -hmm. I, that's, a, that's what I'm encouraging my Latter-day Saint uh, neighbors to do. Read your own stuff. I like reading scriptures. Okay, well, read how your prophets have interpreted scriptures. Mm -hmm. Because TikTokers don't have more authority than prophets and apostles to read scripture in the Latter-day Saint framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm just reading scriptures. And so if someone's giving different philosophies and different understandings, why would I even, like, Because they're bother? prophets. You, Van Hale? Brigham Young. Yeah, Brigham Young was. And apostles are called prophets in some sense, right? Yeah, but some, you know, not everything they say is, is true. You have to, you have to understand that uh, you, with the Sola Scriptura view, you read something in the Bible. You're kind of taking the Sola Scriptura view now, right? Aren't you? You're, you're, ask, you're asking me to do it. You're asking me no longer to pay attention to what your own prophetic tradition teaches. You're asking me not to even look at the history of what your own prophets have taught and to, go, to, to circumvent that and go straight to Scripture. No, I'm not saying that I'm sola scriptura in the fact that we should... Uh, Prima scriptura, maybe, where they have final authority over the... Yeah, so when I, when I say I'm not going to bother reading these talks and essays because the the room for error there is a lot higher. You're just quoting LDS prophets and apostles mostly. Uh, what I said still is true. I, I, so, so it's I, exasperating because Latter-day Saint theology says we have modern-day prophets and apostles. Yeah. And then we were like, okay, we'll read them. And they're like, well, uh, Well, it's another fallacy. It, it, I'm not saying yeah. don't read the prophets and apostles. You're treating them like they're thorns and thistles. No, I'm saying that if we go back to the 1800s or however back, and we're reading what these different people have speculated, and they're disagreeing with each other, that's a lot different than reading general conference talks by prophets and apostles. These are general conference talks. Sure, but how recent? It's the whole history of what Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles have taught in general conference talks and other venues. But if you, if you wanted to just limit yourself to general conference talks, then do that. Go to scriptures.byu.edu, see what your own prophets have said about scripture. I mean, you're still in trouble there. You're still in trouble because Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles have had fundamentally different views about spirit birth. And look at the 1909 origin of man statement. Look so, at the 1916 yeah. uh, first president, father and the son statement. I'm, I mean, you're a TikToker. I'm a YouTuber. So if someone really cares about Latter-day Saint theology, they probably should skip us, right, and go to Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles to see what they teach, right? Well, if I want to know what have they taught, it's not a bad thing to say, oh, I wonder if something's written by trusted Latter-day Saint scholars who summarize what your own prophets and apostles teach. So when you say that they summarize what the prophets and prophets teach, you're a little bit misleading because the prophets and apostles today, they, they don't go into the, the weeds. Christofferson takes a Robert's view. Last I checked. You're, yeah, it, it comes up. Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles today still, as it were, leak out or affirm at times the, the Robert's view. Yeah, so I think that... Gospel uh, principles, uh, gospel fundamentals, priesthood manuals, institute manuals, seminary manuals. Just, just look, at their, look at what your own institution teaches. I do. I look at the gospel principles manual. That's a lot different than some ran, like an essay by Van Hale. So I'm, I'm telling you, like B.H. Roberts, right? Was he a prophet? So I'm saying I'm not going to trouble myself with looking at things that, hey, I don't know if this is, is opinion or if it's true. So I think that you did a lot of research on lots of different guys' opinions that disagreed with each other. Mm -hmm. But you're claiming that I'm the one in trouble. But yeah. in my PowerPoint, I went over that we are children of God, literally, and that we are the same species of God. And so we haven't even touched on that. We're kind of going into... Is the word literally in Scripture? Okay, so here's the thing. You're saying it needs to say the word literally for me no, to believe no. it. I'm saying in the absence of the word literal in Scripture regarding spirit birth, who should I look to for a definition? The not not, not of, TikTokers. The authors of the Bible. There, well, where is the word literal for spirit birth? It's not there. So when Latter-day Saint leaders teach that we have a literal father and we're literal offspring, mm -hmm. where should I go to learn the definition? 
uh, I would say, what do the scriptures teach about us being children of God? I absolutely agree. Uh -huh. But if I have modern day prophets and apostles, mm -hmm. what should I include in that survey? Yeah, so if all the prophets and apostles agree that we are literal children of God? They, they don't, they haven't always agreed on what that even means. Blake Osler means, makes the point that Smith himself did not distinguish between intelligences and spirits and souls. And, and yeah, he was still learning. So all the prophets in the past like century, they've all taught that we are literal children of God. This isn't some controversial topic within our church. Did Smith teach that? I, I believe so. Did I don't, I, I so? think that you're trying to change the direction of where I'm going here. Sorry, it's, go ahead. It's a lot more consistent. All the prophets and apostles say that we are literal children of God. Your own Bible says that we are the same species of God with the word genos in Greek. So you, are you picking up on Acts 17? Yeah. So in Acts 17, as noted previously, Paul says, you are the, or is it we or you? We are the offspring of God, for in him we live and move and have our being. So why should I walk away from that thinking my being doesn't depend on God for its very existence? Seems like a pretty, like, faithful biblical reading of that passage is, oh, if I just rewind 10 verses or so, where Paul is stirred up by the idolatry of the, of the people, and he talks about how God is not worshipped as though he needs anything but created everything. If I have the kind of being that Paul says doesn't live in temples built by human hands, mm -hmm. who's independent, sufficient, who is worshipped as though he is uniquely independent, when I come to that passage and it says, in him I, we live and move and have our being, why should I take the Osler, the Roberts, uh, view that I have always individually existed and that my being is not dependent on the mind of God. Because he's talking about our spirit. Meaning? We're, that we're spirit children of God. In him we live and move and have our being. Yeah, so back in this time, B.H. Roberts hadn't been born yet. Okay, so when you're listening what they're teaching and they say that we're, that we're the offspring of God using the word genos, which means the same kind, likeness, and species, then how can you say, no, I don't think that's true? Because in the, hold on, in the Roberts view, you didn't get your original species from God. I'm talking about, you, 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 you live in 35 AD. B.H. Roberts doesn't exist. Here, we, here we're learning that we are literally the offspring of God, or we're the offspring of God. He doesn't say literally. Right. And the word for offspring is genos. And we also have, hey, Adam that made Seth in his own likeness and image, mm -hmm. right? he quoted that Seth is just as much a child as, from Adam as Adam is from God. So let's pull that thread. When Adam had Seth, he did it through copulation, right? Right. Okay, so how far do I stretch that analogy with Genesis 1? Where did Adam get his body? Yeah, so we're, we can speculate there. I would say... We already have... We, we want to pull that thread. It's literal, yeah. right? It's literal. Yeah. It's the same. Mm -hmm. So is it not so literal? Am I supposed to withdraw and be like, well... Maybe not. So this is where Latter-day Saints have speculated. Yeah, speculation. Mm -hmm. Maybe Van Hale says this. Maybe Heavenly Father brought a wife into the garden and literally, that word has a lot of, uh, a lot of currency, begot Adam's, Adam and Eve's body. Right? Brigham Young says, well, maybe Adam and Eve is Heavenly Father and one of his wives, and they come to eat the forbidden fruit, the, 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 and, then, and they are able to have mortal children because of having the fruit, and there's other Latter-day Saints who said, no, maybe Adam's body was created from the dust of the earth. And then all of a sudden, in that third view, it's not exactly like Adam begetting Seth anymore, is it? There's some sort of analogy happening in there that is a cause for comparison, right? And yeah. similarity, but it's not in an exact equivalent. So it doesn't, it doesn't reveal that. It doesn't reveal exactly how Adam is made. It gives a figurative example that he was formed from the earth, which is a metaphor. We, don't, we were not literally formed like a snowman. Why not from dirt? Uh, maybe it's true. That's, right. just, that's just my speculation. Why not just take it by default like that? Why, why not believe that woman was created from the root of man? Because the creation and the garden mm -hmm. is full of symbolism that I, I, I don't believe that, that there, there were trees. I think that it was all symbolism. My, that's my opinion. So I think that this is told in a story in a way that we can all understand. So... The, same, the point is that the same way Seth is a son of Adam, Adam is a son of God, that, yeah. Ad, that Adam said, I'm going to leave my father and mother and be with my spouse. 
who else could he be referring to? Have Latter-day Saint prophets interpreted that passage like you have? I don't know. Then why should I take the word of a TikToker? No, over... take the word of the Bible. Well, if your prophets and apostles are the ones who help me have a clear understanding of what Scripture means, mm -hmm. and you're potentially giving me a meaning that is unprecedented within your own prophetic tradition, mm -hmm. then why should I take your word for it? Don't, don't, don't take my word. The okay. Bible. You are sola scriptura. That's your authority. So if in the Bible, Adam says, I'm going to leave my father and mother, who is Adam referring to? Uh, he's referring to the, the structure and, and um, the pattern of ethics going forward. He's not referring to him having left Heavenly Father. I, I'm, I'm not even convinced Latter-day Saint scholars and historians are going to read that passage the same way. I, no, really, stop right here. I, it's important for me when I listen to Latter-day Saints who give their opinions, to take their personal opinions seriously. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I have to triangulate it with what your own prophets and apostles have said, if it's supposed to be somewhat implicitly representative of Latter-day Saint theology. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm taking your prophets and apostles more seriously than you are. I feel like I'm taking your Bible more seriously than you are. <laughs> well, if you're a Latter-day Saint taking the Bible seriously, you do that with the help of the interpretive lens of Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles. I do that right? with the interpretive help of the Holy Spirit. So by and through the prophetic witness. If, right? if someone was sola scriptura in 33 AD, they would reject Jesus Christ because a lot of what he said was not in the Old Testament. I think you might, just to be clear, I think you might misunderstand what sola scriptura means by, by saying that. Okay. Sola scriptura is different from an open or closed canon concept. Sola mm -hmm. scriptura is built on the idea that um, divinely inspired speech has more authority than, say, feelings or human intuitions about nature or tradition. In Latter-day Saint, uh, in some veins of Latter-day Saint thought, there's a shared sense that divine inspired speech in scripturated has more kind of concrete sticking power hmm. than you know, what your bishop says or what a prophet says when you shoot in the breeze, right? Like there, there's something about in scripturated divine, divinely inspired speech that has more public sticking power for God's leading of a community than TikTok opinions. So I think that you're putting my identity equivalent to a TikToker or TikTok opinions. Or a YouTube, or a YouTuber, man. Okay. It's not just you. It's All right. or BYU professors or um, CES teachers. So yeah. what scriptures teach in the Latter-day Saint framework typically is seen to matter more than the opinions of um, social media guys. That's me and you. But sola scriptura is let scripture interpret scripture, right? That it has the it has final authority with respect to the means or the, cre the creational medium of God communicating his authority. It's, it's, it, my conscience will not be bound by the traditions of man. My conscience is bound by what the word of God either explicitly says or entails. And your conscience, you can tell by your feelings? By reading scripture. It's okay. my, my feelings are not a good interpreter of scripture. But, but, but you said your conscience is? Scripture is. That's the, that's the source. That's the, uh, what's the Latin term, the formal authority? I forget the actual term. Well, why did you bring up your conscience in helping you understand My scripture? conscience, so I'm married. I have my father. Um, my, my role as a believer with other believers in my own family, in my church, is to point myself and point others to what God has said. I don't have final authority. Tradition doesn't have final authority. God does have, he has a final authority. Mm -hmm. And what he says matters more than what people feel or what people say. But so what, what he says, like what the scripture, what the Bible says. Yeah, yeah. What, we're anywhere, yeah. Okay. So that, that is technically, technically uh, compatible with a 30 AD open canon category. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is before when you said you let scripture interpret scripture and God's word has the final authority, then when I asked you who is Adam referring to when he's leaving his father and mother, you started to give your own interpretation. You said, oh, ethics, and then change the subject. I don't want to change the subject unnecessarily. If you, want me to land, if you want to stay there for a while, that's fine. I'm not convinced that you're going to feel comfortable staying on that thread when I start asking, okay, so how far do you push that? Is, is, has Adam left dependence from Heavenly Father? Has Adam left the household of Heavenly Father? Has Adam left uh, a kind of authority submission relationship with Heavenly Father. When I left my father's house mm -hmm. to marry my wife, Stacia, um, sorry, when you left your, when I, well, is, let's just rewind and, and ha make this analogy work better. Um, 
when you left the authority of your father, I moved out, I married my wife. Uh, there's a transition there, mm -hmm. whether it's straight into marriage or independent adulthood. I stopped submitting to my father in the same way. All right? I, I'm no longer bound by the same set of commands as my, that my father used to have. When I was 12, my father could say, come home and do the dishes. When I was 20 years old, living, there was a different kind of arrangement I had with my father. There was more independence there. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm not going to put a one-to-one -one on that with my heavenly father. My father always has authority to tell me what to do. His commands are not evanescent. They're not, uh, uh, they're not like spoiled milk. They don't, they don't lose their sticking power. So how is this relevant to Adam? Because the idea of, of Adam saying um, people leave the household. He didn't say people leave the household. Quote it for me. Sorry. He said, shall a man leave his father and mother? Right. Okay. So if you're Adam and you say, shall a man... The only example you have of a man is yourself. And then the only example you have of, of father and mother is, who you're limited with options here of who Adam could be referring to. And, and then on top of that... So do you think Adam left Heavenly Father in some sense? He was in the presence of... Uh, More than leaving the presence, do you think he left the authority of Heavenly Father? I don't think we're talking about authority, are we? Uh, it absolutely pertains to that. Oh, why, absolutely. Why yeah. do you think we're talking about authority? Because the uh, category that... Um, is spoken of here is about leaving the authority of parents and entering into marriage. You, yeah, you, I, you leave and what? So you cleave. No, no, you leave and cleave. Yeah. What's the leaving? I, so there's a, there's a leave and cleave there that, that, that severs the kind of relationship I had with my parents. Mm -hmm. Did Adam stop having the kind of relationship with his parents that I stopped having with my parents when I left the household? I think you're using the word authority, but there could be lots of other things we could insert there. For example, if he's not leaving the authority of God, is he leaving the presence of God? Is he leaving the methods and teachings of God? There could be lots of things of God that he's leaving, but you seem to say authority is what he's talking about with such confidence. Inclusive Why? of authority. Because it's, the, it's the category and pattern of people leaving the household to go marry, leaving cleave. Okay, but that pattern hadn't been established yet because he's setting right. this pattern, right? No, we should trust God to speak transcendent words that speak to the future. Okay, so... So here, if, if Adam is talking about leaving his, his mom and dad, so to me, I don't know why he would even bring up a mother in the first place if a mother didn't even exist. Why wouldn't he just say, shall a man leave his father and cleave? Okay. So have your, have your leaders taught it that way? That I'm asking nice you, what, what does the Bible say? Let scripture interpret scripture. There's no, uh, he was the first man. There's no, there's no, um, human prior to Adam. There is no woman prior to Eve. That's the way the story goes. Yeah, I agree. I'm talking about... That's not... That's, when you say you agree, th that's kind of a tenuous agreement, though, right? Because there's like millions of other Eves, millions of other Adams, millions of other moms and dads prior to Adam and Eve. Uh, right? I, I don't mean to, like, corner you, but I, I've made a point here, mm -hmm. and now you're talking about other Adams and Eves. You're, you're sh shifting the goalposts. This is a fallacy. I Adam like, was the first man. I'm, I'm going to press on this. Yeah, he's the first man. But he's You're talking, arguing that, that there, he wasn't the first man. No. I'm talking about who is he referring to when he says, leave my father and my mother. He's referring to how his kids are going to leave his household. Why do you think that? Because it's prototypical. So that doesn't sound like scripture interpreting scripture. That's Aaron interpreting scripture. Okay. Well, I think we should move on because, I mean, if you want to press it, press it. But um, I, don't, I, think it, I think you're milking something that your own prophetic tradition hasn't milked. I'm talking about the Bible, you know. Uh, our, our, our prophets do teach about a heavenly mother. Do they use that verse for it? No. Then I'm not as interested in it. Well, that's why my social media pages are called Latter-day Logic, is because I, I say, hey, have you thought about this before? So are, you, are you teaching your prophets how to interpret scripture? No. Okay, so I'm more interested in what your prophets have said about scripture than what you in uniquely or innovatively said about scripture. But that doesn't mean you can just disregard it. Sure, but in a debate format where you're implicitly trying to be representative of the Latter-day Saint tradition, whether or not you're representative of the Latter-day Saint tradition in some substantial fashion matters. Well, I'm trying to be representative of truth. Okay. Okay, and I see that the Bible says that Adam has a mother. Like, well, okay, should we just scratch that part out in our Bibles? Okay, I, you know what? I, if you want at that point to stick, let it stick. I think we should move oh, on. Yeah, we'll move on. I think we're cycling we'll around. Okay. Uh, 
El Shaddai. I think I need to get some uh, questions in uh, relative to what we've done before. Okay. I, I don't, maybe, maybe not. But go ahead. Go ahead. So who do you think El Shaddai is the most high? Okay. Why do you think that? Because that's the way the Bible puts those terms together in mm -hmm. the context of the Old Testament. He is Adonai, he is El Shaddai, he is Jehovah. Yes, so I'm glad you brought this up. So a lot of the times when the scriptures are referring to uh, Asherah or El Shaddai or Adonai, these feminine figures, that the scribes have changed it to be referring to sometimes about Jesus, okay? Like wisdom is Jesus, right? But who was it referring about originally before the changes in the Bible happened? He and I both agree that there are errors in the Bible. Uh, Meaning that it's transcription errors, maybe. Sure. But not, yeah. not the errors of the originals. Yes, but where are they? You know, we don't have the originals, right? Uh, we can faithfully reconstruct. So, yeah, so we agree we don't have the originals. Yeah, but okay. we can faithfully reconstruct. Sure. So if King Josiah has made some reforms to the traditions of ancient Israelite worship, and one of those reforms was eliminating Heavenly Mother from their traditions, then afterwards in the writings, they're now culturally writing about these reforms and these Is changes. Is there one positive verse in the extant Old Testament speaking positively of Asherah? Speaking positively? Mm -hmm. All I know is that, they've, that they reference this figure and that the archaeological evidence is that they have honored and revered this. And when you say speaking negatively, that's part of the Josiah reforms. Are there any prophets or apostles in the LDS prophetic tradition who identify Heavenly Mother as Asherah? Not that I know of. Okay, then why should I, then why, why even go down that path? Because it's, it's there. Are you Let's seeking look to, at it. Are your, is your apologetics community seeking to teach your prophets and apostles that the original Asherah was Heavenly Mother. We're not that unified. I don't, I don't know what the other apologetics that are doing. That is an understatement, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that kind of proves we're not a cult, too. Sure, fine. <laughs> I mean, you're a, you're a variegated group that has very different views on these. Right, so. But, I, but, but you're, if you claim to have prophets and apostles, mm -hmm. their interpretive tradition should matter more than your own, your own innovative take on things. Yes, now the Josiah reforms, if they were trying to eliminate Heavenly Mother from the scriptures, and then they put Heavenly Mother in a negative light, the scribes that have made some changes after it was written, for example, uh, the prophecy that, the Old Testament, by the way, before it, it, some of it has been tampered with, it was very messianic. But now when you have the Book of Mormon in, Book of, in uh, Old Testament times, it's very messianic. But there's no positive statements of Asherah. That's the point I'm making. There's no positive statements because of the reforms of Josiah. Have your prophets made that link? Uh, actually, a, a non-member, a, a yeah. different Christian made yeah. this. If you're giving more interpretive authority to Margaret Barker, et cetera, mm -hmm. than your own prophets and apostles, then why should I even be a Latter-day Saint? Because if you, got, if you guys can't trust your own prophets and apostles to supply you. That's a fallacy. Well, if you, hold on. If you can't trust your own prophets and apostles. No, we trust our apostles. Hold on. That's hold a on. false presupposition. I'm going to finish the statement. Well, that's a false presupposition. I'm going to finish it with, with the other clause. If we you, trust our prophets if and you apostles. Can't, let me finish it. If you can't trust your own prophets and apostles to supply you with the interpretive uh, currency or help or arguments or beliefs, if you can't look through the lens of what your own prophets and apostles teach about Scripture, then there's not much motivation we have to become Latter-day Saints. We're, because it looks like the LDS prophetic tradition is not held in high esteem by your top apologists. And that's why the Blake Osler stuff matters so much. Because no, he, he thinks... We're not sola scriptura. So we're not going to sure, heavily yeah. rely on... Like when you say, have your prophets said that? That's a very sola scriptura take on it. Because that's assuming you're only going to believe... Like, like be a, a lazy believer. We don't believe in, be, in being lazy learners. We seek after yeah. the mysteries. There's lots of truths that you said are not in the Bible. So it hasn't been said by the, by the prophets and apostles. Well, this one hasn't. Then why should I even take it? Because there are still mysteries okay, well, and truths to learn. It, the, the, the point here is that your prophets and apostles have said a lot about this topic. And you don't seem to give it much credence. You, you really don't seem to actually functionally think that your prophets are apostles or that, you're, that your prophets are, apostle, are prophets or that your apostles are apostles. If you don't trust your leaders on these topics, why should we? 
I trust they because they, they didn't talk about Ashira because this is actually on a, spirit birth on literal on the topic of this debate on us being literal spirit children. If you don't trust Brigham Young in this, why should I? If you don't trust Charles Penrose in this, why should I? If you don't trust uh, James Talmadge and Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce McConkie on these core issues, why should we? I think if, when if you're, if you're when not, you say if you're not trust, willing to, yeah, you're like to take their positions as truth, as infallible truth, some form of semi-fallible truth, anything close to that, it looks like the LDS apologetics community has to kind of turn a blind eye. I, I remember going to a symposium called the Society for Mormon Philosophy and Theology. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy there named Eric Nielsen who got up and he gave a, uh, a talk defending the doctrine of spirit birth. And it was not received favorably. He, this, this, mm -hmm. I mean, you, it, it's interesting that the people in the room, they could care less what LDS prophets and apostles have taught about spirit birth. So I'm, I'm left wondering, why should anyone want to be a Latter-day Saint? Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. If so, we can't trust your prophets and apostles on the doctrine can't. of spirit birth, spirit begetting, what it means to be a little child of God. What you're doing is you're taking the assumption that if the New Testament of Jesus Christ church, the, the church of, of the New Testament of Jesus Christ, has been restored now, and that there are prophets today, mm -hmm. then their words would be infallible. At least helpful. They are helpful, but you're you're saying you go can't talk to the BYU Apologetics Club and ask them about Blake Sorry, Oster's you're view saying of that we adoption. can't trust the apostles and the prophets. You're on apologists that's a fallacy. This. You're I, on a, I'm, yeah. I, I'm telling you that we can't say that their words are infallible. You can't even say they're helpful or, or true but or basically mostly true about even spirit. if you if if you were to take on the belief that maybe God did call more prophets today, I would I would look to them for the interpretation of scripture. Say, just, I, I let you finish your point. Go ahead, sorry. You would not assume that these mortal men would speak infallible words always. Even if I had a liberal Protestant view of a kind of semi-inerrant, semi-infallible, and I don't, but even if I took that view, it would still be a higher view than Latter-day Saints, especially the BYU Apologetics Club, et cetera, has. I don't think you can say that. You're saying hypothetically, if it was, I'd be better. It's kind of like saying, well, if I had the chance to be an Olympic sprinter, I'd be better than that guy. It's, it's like you're, you can't just say I'd be better when you haven't experienced it. I'd be better. It. What do you mean by that? Sorry. That you would better treat the words of the prophets as infallible I ought to word. in principle. That's the idea. It's, it's the sola scriptura limitation. So if there is truth outside One more and there's, there's people that can say things that are their opinions, then if that's their opinion, that's fine. All right. If it's true. The, so here's my final point. The Latter-day Saint view of spirit birth, as interpreted by the four major views, Osler, mm -hmm. Pratt, Young, Roberts, usually has a re relatively external, superficial, partial view of fatherhood. The historic Christian view is more substantial. And my final point is this. If Latter-day Saint apologists don't trust Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles on spirit birth, then why should we? We do trust them. I'm saying that sometimes people give their opinions. So spirit birth is that we were spiritually born by heavenly parents. We all believe that. So who's the we? So, well, that's what's true. If so, people, who's the we? Uh, I'm saying that members of the church believe that. No, that's not, that's not monolithic. It says it in the true. family proclamation. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you to Devin. Thank you to Shiloh. Thanks for the audience coming. Thanks for taking, putting your seatbelt on and putting it back off now. And we're happy to socialize afterwards, happy to talk about things. Please look at the bookstore. Take care. I think you really should go read those essays. <laughs>